Okay, so in this lecture, we're looking at offences to negligence claims. These, this lecture is different because it focuses more on the defendant rather than the claimant, which we, we've been doing before. This is because the defendant's the one raising these defences, the burden of proof is on them, and the standard is on the balance of probabilities. It's important to remember that there's no limit to the number of defences raised. If you have a problem question which looks like you have more than one defence, don't choose between one of them. Raise all of them. So for the specification at City, we focus on contributory negligence, consent and illegality of the defences. That's what this lecture is looking at. There are more defences you can read about them, but this lecture won't be covering them. So starting with contributory negligence. It's important to realise this is only a partial defence. What it does is reduce the damages according to the claimant's responsibility to the damage. An important piece of legislature here is the Law Reform Contributory Negligence Act 1945, Section 1.1. And to use this defence, the defendant has to prove that the claimant is at fault and that their fault caused the damage. So... You can use contributory negligence in various circumstances. A big one is failure to wear a seatbelt. In Freeman Butcher, there was a couple, they were in an accident, neither were wearing seatbelts. The injuries that they suffered were of different ranges. Some of them would have been prevented, some of them would have been less serious, some would have occurred anyway. And this case provides us with guidelines that we still use now. So it looks to see how much you'd reduce the damage per injury. So if the injury would have been prevented altogether, it would be 25%. If it would have been less severe, 10%. If it wouldn't have been prevented at all, 0%. It's important to discuss the fact that I think these reductions are quite low. However, the argument could be that this is because the driver has to have insurance. As a driver in the UK, you have to have insurance and that's there to allow covering any accidents which occur. That's why the damages are quite low, especially for the prevented altogether. That money is there for that purpose and it should be used. There's no point in trying to store it. Other cases you can use contrary negligence and there's a lot of cases. Look at the cases, see which one's most similar to the question you have. That way you'll know which ones to use. So in Owens, both the passenger and driver were drinking. They both ended up drunk, got in the car, crashed into a lamppost. The claimant contributed to that by drinking with the defendant. They've been part of that process. In Badger, the claimant was suffering from a, a, a lung cancer. This was due to the asbestos at work. However, knowing they had lung cancer, knowing how bad smoking is, they continued to smoke. And this resulted in a 20% reduction in their damages. We can also look at Gao. So this is where three children were crossing the road aged 17, 13 and 10. Flurry stops for them. They think, OK, I can cross. They keep going. The defendant's car does not see them due to the lorry, hits them. And the question was, was it reasonable for them to cross in this manner? And the courts held that it was dependent on their age. As we know, Children are judged at a lower standard. It's a lower threshold for them. So I think for the 13 year old and the 10 year old, they thought it was reasonable to think it was okay to cross once the lorry had stopped for them. However, the 17 year old was unreasonable. They should have known better. They're older. It's a higher standard which they're judged at. Important to note, you can't raise this defense to assault and battery. These are intentional offenses. You cannot contribute to them. And a case which supports this is Pritchard. It's a 2011 case, quite recent. Um, we can then move on to consent. So once you raise the defense of consent, the burden of proof shifts to the claimant. They have to show the absence of consent. And there's three main requirements for this. You have to show or show lack of agreement, full knowledge and voluntary choice. So, looking at agreement, we can talk about ICI and Shatwell. They were testing detonators and decided to do it in an open space, knowing that they're not meant to do this. I think they did it to save time. And there was an explosion. There's, there was an implied agreement between the two to run the risk as they knew what the risk was when they decided to test it in open space. 
the defendants no longer liable for that. That was their decision. They knew what they were doing, chose to continue. And we can also look at full knowledge of the nature and extent of the risk. So in Dan and Hamilton, the driver was drunk. The passenger knew this and still got in the car. She suffered severe injury and the court held that she may have consented to getting in the car with a drunk driver, but she would you can never consent to death or severe injury. And so the claim didn't succeed. An important piece of legislature here is the Road Traffic Act, 1988, section 149, basically stating drivers must have insurance. This excludes the defense of voluntary assumption of risk for this reason. Your insurance is there to cover accidents where they occur, you should be paying. We can also talk about the voluntary choice of the claimant. This basically says you've chosen to do this out of your free will. There's been no duress, no pressure on you, nothing like that. So in Morris and Murray, they were drinking with the claimant. They were well aware of how drunk he was and they still got on a plane which he was flying. They were aware of the risk and they still chose to run this risk out of their free will. It was their own decision. Furthermore, it's being used to set a standard of care. So in Woolridge, a photographer was trying to get pictures. He went a little too close and he was hit by a jockey in the process. And it said here that the photographer should know that the jockey's focus is on winning the race. They're not focused on, okay, there may be a photographer here. I may hit them by going closer to the race to where you're at the risk of being hit by a jockey. You've allowed your decision. You've gone forward. You've allowed it to happen. Okay, the last defence we're looking at is illegality. There are a lot of cases here. It basically states that where the loss is as a result of the legal activity, you cannot claim for it. So in Joyce and O'Brien, they stole ladders, they put them onto a van and they weren't able to close the door because of it. While they were driving away, one of them fell out, the claimant, he was injured in the process and the courts held that because their action was as a result of their illegal activity, they could not claim. This defence has been established on the basis of public policy. You can't have an action founded on immoral or illegal actions. We can also look at Delaney, and this is slightly different. So in this case, they were driving to get marijuana. The driver was driving negligently and the passenger was injured while this was happening. It was held that this was unrelated to their illegal activity. The accident was caused by the driving. It wasn't caused by the fact that they were going to get marijuana. It wasn't caused by the marijuana. And so the defense of illegality cannot be raised. Okay. Uh, Valina is also quite an interesting case. I think it's funny as well. So here there was a criminal. He always tried to escape via window. This one time he did it, he fell, fractured his skull. And his argument was that the police should foresee that he was going to try and escape and he was going to do it by this manner. They owed him a duty of care to stop this and prevent this harm from occurring to them. But again, on the basis of public policy, you cannot claim when you are engaging in criminal activity it wouldn't make sense for the for the courts to allow such claims to succeed. Again, we can move on to Graham's and Thames train. So you can't rely on personality change from a previous accident for your illegal actions. He was in a train accident, suffered personality loss as a result of PTSD and depression, killed a stabbed a homeless man to death following an accident, and tried to claim. It didn't succeed, his actions were illegal. Um, Revel is, and Newbury is different. So here, burglars are allowed to claim where they've been harmed. So he, they went onto his property, tried to burgle, he came out with a gun and he shot them in the back, which means they were leaving, they were running away. They were able to claim here because the shot was optional, it was premeditated, the defence of illegality can be couldn't be raised here. He wasn't they weren't shot while they were stealing, they were shot while they were leaving. They were trying to escape. Um in Moore, 
the court said that they can't assist recovery for loss as a, for damage lost from your own fraud. If your fraudulent behaviour has left you, resulted in you losing this much money, fraud is a crime. They aren't going to support you. They aren't going to assist you in getting that money back or your loss back. Lastly, uh, there's Henderson. This is a very recent case. She was suffering from schizophrenia and she ended up killing her mother. And she said that the NHS Foundation Trust was responsible for her health care. They should have stopped her from doing so. And it was held that, yes, they were liable for her health care, but you cannot compensate her for killing her own mother. Her legal actions are on her own. She can't rely on a claim based on these illegal actions. So this has been quite a short lecture, but it's really focused on what you know, what the cases are, how to apply them.